All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. So this is Web Performance at Datash Meredith. Uh, I'm Brian Piccione, Senior Director of Brand Platform Development. And uh, with me is Russell Brown, uh, Manager on our Performance Engineering Team, or as we like to call them, the Speed Team. So what are we going to be talking about? Uh, I'm going to be covering stuff about uh, the various optimizations that we've done. And then I'll hand it over to Russ, and he's going to talk about uh, how we monitor performance and all of that good stuff. OK, but first, who is Dot Dash Meredith? What is Dot Dash Meredith? Well, we're America's largest print and digital publisher, and we reach over 200 million people every single month. So now you know the, the big company behind brands like these. Some of them you know, some of them you don't. But you know, you can see that we're spread across uh, content verticals like entertainment, finance, food, and a whole bunch of others. So Dash uh, is basically, if, if any of you are, are as old as I am, uh, you'll remember about.com. Uh, it's actually, that's where we got our roots. So we, we split about.com into different content sites back in 2016. And ever since then, our playbook has been the best content, the fastest sites with the fewest ads. So that's what we're here to talk about. So it's central to our uh, business strategy. So what, is this, what does fastest sites mean? Uh, well, over the years, that's, there's been a bunch of different metrics on how to define that. Some good, some really amorphous. Um, but luckily, in, uh, in around 2020, Google came up with the core web vitals and really defined what a fast user experience is. Um, so, you know, in case this hasn't been covered, although I hope it's been covered at some point, um, LCP, FID, CLS, those are the three core web vitals, measuring loading performance, interactivity performance, and visual stability, which is, which is what the browsers, and especially Google, have, have determined as, as, you know, a good performing user experience. So let's take a closer look at that. So we, we look at core web vitals, but we also look at um, a bunch of other metrics. Uh, so this is a typical performance timeline that you can actually run on Chrome DevTools. It's, it's really cool. Um, so a user might click a link on Google or type in the URL directly. Uh, and then the first step is the server doing a lot of thinking taking time to gather up data, render a template with all kinds of components and all of that stuff. And uh, that being returned is uh, measured by time to first byte. Then from there, once, once the browser has had a chance to read things a little bit and display something on the page, FCP, first contentful paint. Uh, from there, we've got LCP, which is a measure of the largest element on the page showing up. So in this case, it's probably this uh, yummy pizza image. And then time to interactive is sort of when, when everything has been loaded and wrapped up and parsed and all of that, the browser is done thinking and you can finally start scrolling or interacting with the page. So how do we optimize all of these little things? Uh, there's, there's lots of good stuff here. So um, basically, uh, Google and, you know, they try to include other browsers, but really it's Google. Uh, they recommend about an 800 millisecond time to first byte as good. Uh, it seems quite high, though, but I think they are trying to cater for, you know, some sites that are server-side rendered, some that are client-side rendered. Um, so it's pretty lenient. So what do we do to optimize that? So we try to render stuff as much as we can on the server-side. Uh, we include or exclude components with based on whatever business logic we have. We show things based on de device type. Um, you know, more than just media queries, we actually like will check what device is requesting this page and return a set of uh, components. And uh, even our A/B testing is server side, so that's fun. Mm -hmm. uh, another huge thing for for time to first byte is is caching, and so we have several layers of caching, and even within our, our data APIs, we have um, caches. But you know, the first is we make, we make extensive use of, of Java's uh, 
in in memory cache. So you know, if you didn't know, uh, our our public facing sites are a, actually a Java based application. So that's super super uh, helpful because it's it's multi threaded, and we have this this sweet in memory cache. So if it's not in memory, what do we do? We turn to Redis. We have a very large and very highly performant Redis cache. So we fall back to that. If it's not there or it's expired, uh, we will actually hit the, the data APIs. So that's time to first bite. So next up is first contentful paint. And obviously, first contentful paint counts in the time it takes for time to first bite. So it's cumulative. So 1.8 seconds includes that 800 milliseconds from the server. So uh, and it also includes additional time to fetch whatever additional resources are needed on the page. So what do we do here? Uh, so some oldies but goodies, uh, minify and uglify front end resources, uh, lazy loading as much as we possibly can, everything from scripts to images to entire components on the page, pretty much everything below the fold is just going to be lazy loaded. So that gets everything in front of you as soon as possible. But what I really want to talk about is, is our automatic bundling. And now, what does that mean? So this little graphic on the side I found installed from Google is pretty accurate. So what we do is, based on a request, we gather up all of the front end resources that are specific to that request. So there are five components on the page. We get the five style sheets that are for those components, the five JS files or whatever, bundle those together and return those to the user. So you get very, very little unused CSS and uh, you know, a nice, nice small package to go over the wire. Uh, and on mobile, we even uh, strip out any desktop style. So we check our, all our style sheets for anything that's over, I think it's 45M or something like that. And we just exclude those styles entirely. So that's pretty exciting. So what else do we do for FCP? Another huge thing is, is resource hints. Uh, this, is, this has been a topic for, for probably a, a long time for performance. So quick review, uh, DNS prefetch looks up the domain and just prepares for, for you know, we, do, we use it mostly for third-party sources. Pre-connect will do DNS and actually open a connection to that resource. So we prepare there. You can see some revenue things on the right there. And then the last one is preload uh, resource hint. And this one is, is extra special because it'll actually go and load that whole resource. Um, but you have to use it sort of sparingly or the browser just starts to ignore them. Uh, so it's, it's about six to eight we found that, that you can safely preload. Uh, and on the right, you can actually see you know, uh, the top two we usually use like a, an HTML tag. But on the preload side, we're actually using link headers, which is super, super cool because it shows up before the DOM has even finished being parsed and downloaded. And uh, you'll see a little bit more on that in a sec. OK, so here's a pretty old screenshot of web page test. Um, but it does kind of illustrate how you know, the, the resource hints can help. So uh, on, the, on the left, you can see that you know, the resources are only sort of coming in as the DOM has been parsed. But on the right, you can see before the DOM has been parsed, uh, the resources have started loading in. And you don't also have that, that DNS and SSL connection happening there. So that's, that's great. And so that's how we optimize FCP. So next up is LCP. Uh, again, this is cumulative. So it's including time to first byte and FCP. Uh, the recommendation is about two and a half seconds. So you don't have much time from when the first thing starts painting on the page to actually having the, the big things show up, the big pieces of content that people care about. So how do we optimize? Again, time to first byte and FCP. You definitely want to optimize those first. Uh, but the other two major things to optimize are, are your fonts and what we call the primary image, which is uh, the, the first image on a, on a page. So on the font side, we, you know, we run it through a uh, sort of almost like a sieve uh, to remove glyphs that just aren't needed. So like maybe we don't have umlauts or egus in our 
uh, articles, so we just remove those. Uh, so that reduces the font size. And then, you know, using a good compressed uh, format is also super important. So WAF2 is currently the, the best format for that. And uh, we preload those using link headers. So that's one of the six to eight uh, resources that come in is, you know, and that's why we try to limit our brands to like a couple fonts so that we can preload them nicely and LCP is good. Uh, on the image side, we use WebP, but we're really excited to, to bring in AVIF at some point. Uh, sidebar, Netflix has an amazing article on, on AVIF and they did some insane uh, analysis on that. So uh, I did not put the link here, but <laughs> I will share it. Uh, and we also preload that. So here's another look at what this preloading looks like. Um, so this is really, really slowed down. And, and this was just on, on my local. But you can see on the right, like, oh, sorry, on the top, uh, the blue is, is download. So, so it, the HTML at the top is downloading, downloading, downloading. And then the style sheet scripts and, and image are, are slowly coming in. And so it's, it's really like a long time before anything starts showing up. But with the preload headers, and like, yes, the, the, the SSL stuff is here because I don't have H2 on my laptop. But uh, while the HTML is still streaming in, all of these other resources have started coming in, which is great because you know, it brings them up that much further in the request. But you'll notice this, this big, horrible white bar here that is actually, you know, despite our best efforts uh, and, you know, telling the browser to preload this resource, they deem images as low priority, which is kind of rude. But there is a, a new thing that we're, we're playing with right now. Like this week, uh, we are working on uh, adjusting the fetch priority. And uh, maybe we'll do that in a, in a coming talk. All right. So... Here, I wanted to show you a boo-boo that we had. Um, this is a bug that we had last year where we kind of messed up having the, the preloaded image. And you can see it's like almost four seconds for LCP. And I put the, the reference there again. Uh, but then when we, when we added back our, our preload link header, we, we got back to uh, a, good, a good spot and, uh, and everyone felt better. OK. Uh, the last one, time to interactive. So I don't have like 17 slides for this one. This, the, you know, it's a game, it's cumulative. There's a whole bunch of other things to, to optimize first. But what you can still do for time to interactive is, is really get in the weeds on, you know, at the amount of CSS uh, selectors you have, the amount of long tasks you have in JS. And, and that really sort of like cuts down the amount of parsing that the browser has to do before you can actually interact with the page and, and use it. So finally, CLS. CLS is interesting. Uh, it's, it's not a, uh, you'll notice there's no um, unit on the number. It's actually a ratio with a calculation. And I'm going to not tell you how it works because it's hard. Uh, but the, the, the gist of it is, it's measuring how much of the page is moving by how much. So if 10% of the page is moving by 100%, then you're going to get a 0 0.1. And that's right on the cusp. So uh, it's interesting how there are a lot of little shifts on the page that you don't realize until you start looking at CLS. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and in some cases, when, when you're loading a lot of images or you know, maybe you're, you're client-side rendering a lot of things, uh, things can really shift around. So here's um, a bit of an example. It's, it's probably hard to tell, but the left side isn't finished loading, obviously. But the, the left font is actually not the, the, the font that ends up being used. Uh, it's the fallback font. And so what we did was we very carefully selected which fallback font we use because that one loads in first. It's usually like on the, the user's device or um, a commonly used font. So we tweak which font is, is the fallback and we tweak the, the size of the font so that there isn't a huge shift when the actual end state font loads in. And then the other thing you'll notice is this, this gray 
box, depending on where you're looking. It looks green for me. Um, that's, that's our little placeholder. So another huge thing for CLS is, is placeholders, because if that wasn't there, the content would be up here. And then when the image loads in, it shifts down. And that's usually enough for a penalty from Google. So yeah, that's uh, a look at our optimizations. Thank you. And uh, any questions? Can you talk about uh, code minification? Code minification? Yeah, like minifying your JavaScript and CSS. Do we? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm actually struggling to hear you. Oh, yeah, the minifying of like JavaScript and CSS. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we do it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Is that the question? <laughs> okay, yes. So we, we, we do, we minify our, our CSS and JS. The one thing that we don't really do uh, that, that I think a lot of um, more front-end application, or sorry, I should say reactive UE framework applications can do are, is, is tree shaking, where you sort of know from the roots or you know from the, the specific setup that you have, you can shake certain things out and, and exclude it. Uh, we don't really do that, but the, the automatic bundling more than makes up for that. Yeah, I just mean like the benefit you might get from it, you know, from instead of loading like all your code and stuff. Gotcha. Big. Yeah, I mean, I, you the benefit of minification is 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 pretty huge and 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 obvious when you implement it, right? So you know, you when you're writing CSS, it's nicely spaced out. There's new lines. There's you know all kinds of stuff so that you can read it nicely. But if it's minified, it's all on one line, and uh, you know, and in the case of JS, the the, the uglification of it will, will like make your functions single letters and fun stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Some question. Oh, Sergey. Sorry. You have a question. Sorry. Well, quick question. Actually, uh, it seems like it's a, a somewhat of a, a follow up. Um, different businesses have different uh, footprint of their C CSS and JavaScript, right? For your uh, uh, businesses, mostly publishing uh, kind of um, properties, how much is JavaScript a problem for you? Because for many of us, it is uh, the main problem. Yeah. Is it is it for uh, for your properties as well? Uh, yes, it's still a problem. I mean, we you know we are still working hard to remove jQuery, for example, because it's like you know it used to be the thing, right? And like now it's just everywhere, and it's hard to get rid of something that's everywhere. Um, and you know, we I think. What we're doing now is is really getting into the the micro optimizations I was talking about, where there's like a really long running task that's holding up the browser, and we're looking at oh, like do we need to recalculate every single thing, or can we batch this together so that the overall task is a lot shorter? Um, and and add JS is 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 always a thing, you know, like optimizing how the ads are called, where the where they're called, and like the the JS that that runs all those functions. So, yeah, I mean, I would definitely say that that JS is is still it's still a thing because you know interactive elements on the page they use JS and so yeah. I just had one question because I heard that you at one point in time said that uh, you could multi-thread, and so I'm just wondering how you how do you multi-thread your 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 components on the web page because if it works on JavaScript. Yeah, good question. Uh, uh, if you couldn't hear that, he was he was asking if um, you know with with our multi-threading, can we multi-thread on the page? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, because you mentioned multi-thread. Multi yeah, you mentioned the multi. -thread. Yeah. Okay. Well, the multi-threading is all on the server side. So so you know, um, Java is is multi-threaded. So it's it's what it's doing is it's it's creating a a component tree. It's it's rendering the, the or it's gathering up the, the final HTML and all of the resources that are needed, but it's doing it with like, you know, if you, if you know about web workers, it's almost like an, a bunch of little web workers running around and going and getting the things that are needed before it's sort of like packaged up and then sent back right. in so, one package. Right. So you're talking about Java being in multi-threading and preparation at the server side before it gets written up. Yeah, that's right. Tom. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Just one quick question regarding the very last topic. You talked about the cumulative layout shift. Just wondering what's the right toolkit for me as a developer to measure and test that since most of the time I have a very fast connection, so I can't even like notice, you know, yeah. these changes. That's a great question. Thank you. So um yeah, the good the, the, the question was measuring and and um de debugging CLS, right? So so Chrome DevTools is actually amazing with that. So they've, they've got a bunch of different tools. So they, uh, if you go to the rendering tab of your DevTools, it'll actually, uh, you can ask the, the browser to, to show you and like flash like a bit, like a, it gives like a background color to the elements that are causing shifts. And then it also has like a little overlay that will, will display the current uh, CLS value that, that's there. And, um, I guess most importantly, like identifying it, you, you, you are able to throttle your browser and throttle your uh, connection speed so that it's, you know, more closer to sort of like a phone or whatever. So you can set it to fast 3G or slow 3G and really, really slow it down so that, you know, as you see things coming in, that's, that's what I did for, for that, um, for this, is you just, you slow it down and then you can, you know, you can see, uh, wow, when, when, when this content loads, it, it first loads the, the, you know, like the, the text and then the image comes in. So Chrome DevTools is, is definitely the best for that. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Uh, um, so uh, also the DevTool gives you that ratio that you, you showed us earlier. Does it print out um, like what's the ratio for that page in some... Uh, of cumulative uh, shifts, you had you had a number on the screen. You mean this? Yeah. So it's also provided by. Yes, it'll it'll tell you. It'll it'll say you know you're currently at uh, zero point two, and it might even like you know as you scroll down, it might even like change as you you know additional elements come in. Um, so yes, uh, Chrome Chrome will, will will show you that. And, and then uh, a different question. You had a different slide with a box and some and some other boxes that you bundle together. Yes. Um, so and, and then you also mentioned that you're using Java in the back end. Um, I'm wondering how is that actually accomplished uh, in Java, uh, where you're only grabbing the elements that you need to use on that page? Are you using templates? Like how do you? only grab a specific t uh, part of the JavaScript using Java? Uh, well, it's, it's, actually, it's actually really interesting and cool how our system is set up. So, so the, the Java code reads from our sort of like templating engine. And so we have these XML files that describe the components and the resources that are uh, part of that component. So it's not all like one big... Uh, JS library with imports and and all kinds of stuff like a, like a typical um, JS application. It's it's actually sort of like very closely linked to how we we build and, and run the page. So in describing those specific components and those style sheets, we know that when a when a, a request comes in and there's those five specific components, then those five style sheets are concatenated together and returned. Does that make sense? So you're using a component uh, architecture similar to like React, or you're using a completely different system. It's a completely yeah. custom system, like yeah. Templating. But it, but I will say that that if you're familiar with um, atomic design principles, we follow that very very closely. So we you know we define small small components and include them in other components, and then build those up to like a, an organism or a template, and uh, and go from there. So it's it's yeah it's all very custom. I didn't actually include any code this time, but maybe next time. <laughs> hey, um, I might add on that that the CLS is actually sometimes displayed in seconds. So if you use the page speed test, you're going to see it in seconds, which is more intuitive, at least for me. Uh, and then on the same note, um, have you managed to integrate web page speed test uh, into your CI pipelines, for example? And how oh. do you manage that um, across different microservices? Because I have like set of microservices and I was kind of struggling to like integrate it in a way where it stops the build because you don't you don't know like if a single microservice is going to impact the whole bundle. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, 
that's what Russ is going to talk about. So. All right. So <laughs> next talk. Great. 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 That's a perfect question to segue. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. We didn't plant that, did we? <laughs> <laughs> All right, here you go, Russ. Great. Um, yeah, thank you, Ryan. Um, and um, yeah, just uh, a bunch of thanks. Um, uh, thank you, Sergey and Mel. Um, I approached Mel at the Google Dev um, meetup, and they were just so welcoming. I really encourage you to present if you'd like to. Uh, don't be intimidated. Uh, yeah, there are people who know a lot, but if anyone knows speed really well, they're very nice because it's hard. And so, <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a good community. Um, and uh, yeah, and then thank you to uh, Ben and Brian for uh, having uh, well, allowing us to do this. They're the masterminds of uh, my team, uh, which we are uh, the speed team here at uh, Dot Dash Meredith. And on the call, I have Joseph, uh, who's uh, on our team. He's our Zoom host. Uh, shout out to everyone. On uh, online uh, from DDM, uh, and uh, and then we have Ty as well, uh, who's on our team. So we're a team of three. Um, great. So uh, with um, so I was going to talk about uh, performance monitoring. I uh, when I thought about the presentation, I I wanted to share some of the processes that we've come up with um, in the last like four months since I joined DDM and kind of got to know the infrastructure, dive deeper into the industry and terms of what folks are doing with performance. And so I wanted to share that along with our monitoring tools. Um, and uh, the Meet for Speed meetup is really, really great. Uh, I learned a lot from it, um, so thank you. And um, but yeah, so hopefully these are um, some helpful strategies. Um, so overall, um, uh, our uh, goal um, that I uh, set out is uh, to keep everyone informed about the speed of our products. Um, at DDM, we're very fortunate that one of the company's core three uh, goals is uh, to have the fastest sites. So that has a huge impact. I don't know if some of you are in organizations where it takes a lot of work to convince product organizations to prioritize speed. Um, that is not so much a problem here um, uh, because everyone gets the idea and everyone's behind it. So that, that's really great. Um, so uh, shout out to um, them. <laughs> and then um, uh, so... Um, and, and then like kind of within that is the idea that everyone is benefiting from very good speed, right? Like everyone from growth and marketing to, to revenue. So it's really kind of great to, uh, in, in this work, I think also be empathetic to everyone who uh, is, is working that way because I find it makes those conversations easier uh, when, when navigating um, performance issues that come up. Um, and another uh, kind of... Uh, Note here is um, I, I like we talk a lot about availability uh, as engineers, but I think a lot about the availability of our customers' attention because uh, it has an expiration. And so if we are not meeting that, particularly on mobile devices, that's a huge problem. Um, and then just another note, uh, I like to talk about speed because uh, I like GIF race cars. Um, uh, so those are great. And whenever I talk about performance, I feel like buying a Broadway ticket. So I just, uh, so when I say speed, I do mean performance. I, I also like speed because it's kind of a movement metric. It's almost choreographic. It's like a clear directive, you know, whereas performance can be a little nebulous. Uh, I like speed, you know, it, it kind of gets a message across um, that I think is useful. Um, so in the approach, um, so in uh, our work as a speed team often, uh, we'll work with some of our different brands. Uh, we'll work with our core engineering team or um, uh, a variety of people, uh, QA. Um, I, there's kind of two values that I uh, find really helpful. Um, the first one uh, came from uh, the company's merger process that happened last year with Dotdash and Meredith, where uh, folks were saying, be curious and uh, not critical. So I was like, oh, that's really, really great. Because I was getting on calls with people where you know, we're like debugging an issue and then, you know, you want to jump to the blame game or accountability. And it's like curiosity just kind of takes that pressure off pretty quickly. Because uh, especially when there's an issue or an incident, you want to get to the bottom of it pretty quickly. Um, and so with that culture of curiosity, it, I think it supports uh, what happens in speed. If you do the meet for speed meetup, you'll see that it's like this gigantic rabbit hole that you just keep falling down. And, um, <laughs> and um, uh, or uh, uh, Henry um, from Catchpoint, Devrel, uh, he does nice talks um, where he'll like go with HTTP archive. And again, you'll get an answer and then that leads to 10 more questions. So I find that really great. Um, and, and the other great thing about curiosity is it kind of disrupts 
like even my own know-it-all status, right? Like, so I back off that and I'm like, you know, just bringing my information as something to help. Uh, and I might be wrong and there might, and there's surely something new that I'm going to miss because, right, Chrome updates a couple times a month, Safari whenever, and uh, Firefox, what, every six weeks. So, you know, all the APIs, all that, no one in this room is ever going to know all that. So curiosity is the name of the game. Now, uh, the other problem, uh, well, the kind of the other problem to solve that is like, I noticed when we were just curious um, that like analysis would lead to the need for more analysis. And so that was a problem. So we thought, well, let's make sure that we stay informed. Um, so we keep informed. So that um, is certainly about staying abreast with what's happening in the industry. Um, but also, um, uh, so like using can I use, like make sure, okay, so if we're going to use fetch priority, um, you know, what's the latest adoption? Uh, and, you know, what's the risk? And, and going in with that information, um, knowing, well, you know, if we take, if we take this out and add this in, you know, what are the trade-offs? So that's important. Um, and then uh, most importantly, I would think, um, is the data that we collect about our applications. Um, so that's uh, super, super important. Um, so what do we use to monitor? <laughs> uh, so we've been working a lot on uh, coming up with a clear architecture plan. I think particularly after the merger there, I think there were uh, some different tools. So now we're kind of like coming up with a holistic picture and processes so that anybody, you know, from a from a SE one engineer to uh, maybe someone in product, um, you know, if so someone needs to dive in, they we can, or we at least give them like a, a level of which to to dive in. Maybe they aren't going to go super far, maybe just into Google Search Console, but that this information is available and the processes are there. Um, so first, we have um, uh, kind of I, I broke this down by uh, the kind of the development life cycle. So within feature development, our developers use really regularly uh, Chrome DevTools, which we've talked about tonight. Um, and then also web page tests. Uh, once you deployed something remotely uh, into a test environment, uh, web page test is an incredible tool. Um, if you have ones that you recommend, please share. Um, and uh, next, then once we get into continuous integration, uh, our test suite opens up. Uh, so this we call performance engineering. Uh, tests, uh, PE tests, and uh, JMeter helps us look after server performance so we can track uh, time to first byte and last byte to see specifically how a change impacts that. Uh, we have our own uh, custom Lighthouse runs with Jenkins. Uh, we're looking at migrating to Lighthouse CI. So, um, oh, I think you stepped out. Um, oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah, so Lighthouse CI um, is a super useful tool. It makes it a little, I mean, even with your own, I mean, obviously if you have a custom build, you can block your PRs, but Lighthouse CI makes it uh, a little easier to kind of set thresholds. But page uh, tests do the same. Yes, yes. So yeah, web page test has, so those features, especially with Catchpoint, they're starting to overlap. So uh, kind of, we actually had a meeting with Catchpoint yesterday thinking about, okay, how do we, you know, because now that there's, a web page test is pulling in more of the core web vitals. So, okay, what are we, what should we be using? So. Uh, it's exciting and uh, it's great to be with Catchpoint. So, uh, Lighthouse CI is that the same Lighthouse that we, we have in the Chrome Dev Tool, or is that? Uh, so it's a continuous, yeah, it's the same thing, but it's a continuous integration tool. Um, so I haven't used it in a year, um, like hardcore. So I, my knowledge isn't fresh, but um, but yeah, it it has a little easier dashboard tracking. Um, so to look at uh, change on commit over time, and um, yeah, if someone else. Um, has been using it very recently. Um, yeah, please share in the Q&A. Um, and then we also have, um, uh, yeah, so we are also uh, using web page tests. So that's really useful, right? Because if you're using Lighthouse, uh, you're not necessarily getting the waterfall. So if you're kind of going through your development and then you see that there is a negative trend, you want to know why. And so uh, we'll run, uh, we'll then kick off a web page test run. So that's automated. So that way we can get that waterfall and find out why, um, you know, time to first bite went up. Um, then, of course, we have application performance monitoring. Uh, I'm not going to cover that. It's very important to keep track of your error logs and how that's impacting performance. So obviously, that's, uh, that's good to have. And then uh, for internet performance monitoring, um, uh, we are sunsetting New Relic. Uh, most of our infrastructure uh, is on Catchpoint. Um, and uh, Matt Landoff is here and uh, Jeremy, who are, are incredible. Ops uh, observability folks, and um, uh, so they uh, set up a lot of that. So it's incredibly powerful. And then uh, we have a variety of dashboards. 
um, Grafana, Looker, uh, Cabana, and reports to really help share that information. And uh, we're optimizing that. Great. And um, yeah, and so we have uh, these are um, the core um, departments that are looking at speed uh, SEO, observability. All right, so they're uh, looking at all the, the monitoring of live sites, um, site reliability, DevOps, QA, and uh, our engineering which includes our platform team. So they're, they're managing the, the core uh, functionality and infrastructure, and we have um, teams per brands, and then we have speed team. Um, if you don't have like all of those staff on your own development, just think of them as your processes. <laughs> um, you know, like the hat, like, okay, you're the developer. Now you're running in Lighthouse, so now you're the, the DevOps. So I've, we, I, we've all been there, so it's a good thing to do. So yeah, so SEO will uh, typically work with Google Search Council. Uh, although uh, certainly the brands are looking at that as well. Um, I made sure to show one that has no errors. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, uh, yeah, um, but yeah, so that uh, is uh, great to stay on top of. And just an insider, I um, ran a tip. I mean, it seems like uh, FID is still very much the metric, and IMP is not coming soon. And um, just that, and Google reminded everyone that LCP is the number one problem on 50% of sites across the web. So everyone should be working on that. Um, uh, oops, did it skip? Oh, oh, right, there's that lag, sorry. Okay, uh, observability, yeah. So um, this is uh, a view of the charts within the Catchpoint Explorer. Um, they're super awesome. Um, I'll jump back to this later. Uh, and then uh, this is a um, uh, uh, just a screenshot of our JMeter test. So here we can see uh, the different percentiles for time to first byte and time to last byte. Um, so our QAs look at that. Um, and uh, yeah. And then within engineering, engineering's right. Everyone should be. If you're an engineer, you should be using all of it. It helps. Um, but here's the HTML output from the light, uh, Lighthouse run. So um, you know it has a JSON output that we also ingest. Um, and that goes on to uh, some of our analysis dashboards um, to create very handy uh, views and trends and uh, comparisons that are a little beyond what, like, uh, certainly Lighthouse CI could also do. So that's very great to have. Uh, and we have some of our, um, we also have a dashboard where we kind of show the output from all the different runs. We'll typically run uh, 10 per template uh, when we push a code change. And so we can compare. Uh, the numbers and come up with averages. So it's a little intense to look at. Um, we're working on simplifying that or coming up with the averages, but um, it's great um, to have that. And then, right, you can it's nice you can click here and then look at the HTML reports, which also contain suggestions. So if you're not looking at using Lighthouse uh, and looking at the HTML reports, do that because some of the suggestions are super helpful. And then we also have Grafana, uh, which helps monitor our backend performance uh, for uh, weight. Um, so this is really great. It's particularly helpful because we have, um, you know, like a color coding, so you can glance in it and see if there's anything that's problematic. Um, and then, uh, you know, so for this next slide um, or this next part, um, kind of the end, um, I um, I learned that like having all the tools, having great confluence documentation, and like, giving that to everyone, and having teams there is not quite enough. People uh, is kind of helps to have a workflow. Um, or kind of a way of tackling problems. So um, that's kind of, I wanted to give an example. Um, and so like this process I'm describing is, um, you know, informed by our company goals and values, but it's also shaped by very regular meetings, feedback, uh, mistakes. Um, so, yeah. Um, so uh, chase waterfalls. Uh, that's um, uh, my advice, <laughs> if I summed it up in one statement. Um, so... Uh, here we have uh, four stages. Um, uh, alert, so something has gone wrong. Uh, so something like, say, we have a, a RUM uh, alert coming in saying, yo, your LCP has totally spiked. And then, um, or uh, a daily report uh, that come in that you like the, you know, uh, brand manager has seen a, a, a negative trend. Um, from there, um, the next uh, recommendation is to then go look at the dashboards. Um, look at everything. Um, even if it doesn't seem relevant, rule things out. Uh, it's very important to rule it out, especially once you get close to the problem. It's like sometimes it can get really complicated, but it's great to go in knowing like all the other metrics that aren't involved. So look at as many 
uh, charts as you can about that particular issue so you can know it's not a uh, particular. So anyway, I'll get into an example and show you what I'm talking about. Um, and, um, and also use different forms of averages, right? Uh, because each one tells a 75th percentile tells a different story than geometric mean. Uh, if you aren't sure what those are, I you know, still sort of don't entirely get them. Um, just <laughs> compare them, it's okay. <laughs> uh, and then at the end, look at uh, the individual record charts and see how they're plotting, because that really tells a great story. Um, then from there, it's good to stop and form a hypothesis to talk to like talk to other people, form it yourself and say, okay, I have some information here. Uh, I have an idea of what I think is going on here. And maybe that's informed by previous experience because when you do this work for a little while, eventually you do get used to knowing what tends to push up a certain metric. Like, you know, bad ad calls will typically push up um, time to interactive or blocking time or visually complete, uh, which isn't, um, or the speed index, right? Those like later metrics. Uh, and then last, uh, once you have that, then it's useful to go looking at waterfalls directly. Um, if you just kind of start randomly looking at waterfalls, it, you can get really confused. But if you have a sense of where a lot of the metrics are trending, then you can pick the right ones. And I, I noticed when we kind of followed this, that really allowed us to oftentimes, when we looked at our very first record, we were usually finding the issue because we had a pretty informed hypothesis. So uh, just as an example, um, so uh, some of our, our vertical leads get uh, the looker look that we have, um, which uh, pulls in information from Catchpoint and Lighthouse. So we have Catchpoint monitoring, but we also have a couple custom Lighthouse monitors. Um, yeah, again, that can all be updated because Catchpoint's evolving and so Lighthouse. But anyway, we aggregate them here. So in this particular instance, um, we have, uh, you know, the, the brand manager has spotted a negative trend in LCP that it's jumped up uh, 500 milliseconds, say. So uh, that's uh, the beginning of our incident. Um, and so uh, one of the first stops for us is to make sure what tools are reflecting that. So, right, like look at the different dashboards. Like, is Google Search Council saying that we, we're having a bunch of issues? Because, you know, sometimes it's there. Um, if that's not there, then then uh, we would go, say, look at uh, Grafana and say, well, if LCP jumped, let's just make sure that it's not the server doing it. So that's a great thing to rule out right away. Um, so right, we, we know the template that it's going, saying it's happening on our uh, articles. So we've checked that, and we're double checking here, and we know, OK, there's been no um, uh, variation or no significant variation uh, in the server performance. So that's great. So we know. And then we've also seen that in Catchpoint, right? Like there's no time to first buy weight kind of jump. So we're good to go. So we can rule that out and move on. Um, so within Catchpoint, then um, uh, we'll uh, filter a bit more. So we'll pick, um, so they have a, a handy explorer where you can pick your metrics um, from web page. Um, and, um, and then you can pick, again, your averaging methods. And then here we can see that we, 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 we are verifying our negative trend um, in LCP. From there, um, we're like, okay, so we, know, we definitely know that LCP is a problem. So, okay, uh, let's look at our PR history. So we see that somebody pushed uh, at the date of the incident uh, an update uh, to our image component. And so we can then go, okay, all right, so that's helpful. That's another step uh, here in the debugging process. So uh, that gives us a really good hint. So now we know to go back to uh, the, the um, catch point and then look at the individual record like in the scatter plot, which is a really useful thing where it'll show all the records as like little dots. Um, so from there, we're gonna click on one and inspect the waterfalls. So here, um, so within um, our um, uh, uh, web page, uh, well, this isn't web page test, the, the catch point, this is just their normal waterfalls. But here we can see uh, that actually it's given us a hand and it's identified um, the calls that are an issue. Um, and so we have our, our confirmation. Uh, and so from there, we have most of our evidence. So from there, it's probably a good idea to check a couple other synthetic test records, verify it in RUM data, maybe replicate it locally if you really need to. But at that point, you can usually kick off some sort of um, response within the engineering org. Um, so yeah, that was the case study. <laughs> we are hiring. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, certainly you can talk to any of us, but um, uh, the best place to go is uh, dot-meredith.com slash careers and look at those opportunities.
Um, and yeah, go chasing waterfalls. So I, I have two questions. The first one is, and I don't know who, who this goes to, um, what are you doing for image optimization? <laughs> um, well, I, I did mention the, the, the format, right? So we are converting because the uh, editors aren't putting in the right format. So we actually convert JPEGs and PNGs into WebP, okay. uh, which is, which is uh, you know, a much smaller size. And we also um, request a specific, a very specific size for the page. So we, we, we pay careful attention to like, you know, not embedding anything that, that's too, too big for the page. But it's, it's really interesting because, you know, we actually showed recently that, that Google likes high quality images, where before, you know, not too long ago, it was, it was you know, the smallest image at all costs. So we, we were doing you know, teeny tiny images. And, and so the, the um, retina screens of the world and the, the three, four X pixel density phones, it didn't look really great because it was just like, you know, 600 pixels. So we are actually including stuff to allow for um, the higher pixel density, but we definitely like, you know, make it as small as possible. We remove the, um, the metadata and the, the color profiles that that's come from from you know different uh, imaging programs. So yeah, we, we do everything we can to strip out everything that's that's not needed. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a, a follow on question, completely different though. One of your slides up there mentioned SEO, um, and you're also using uh, Google Console. Um, are you doing any um, correlation between performance and SEO, and how are you measuring it? Um, you, do you mean like are we are we reading Google Search Console and reading the Core Web Vital Report? No, are you doing any performance monitoring and then in, and tracking uh, SEO rankings in, in any any manner that way? Like, does the performance affect the SEO? SEO or the speed performance affect the SEO? The, yeah, so it, that's an interesting question. So um, SEO is kind of a bit of black magic. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever worked with with SEO analysts or anything like that, but but you know they'll tell you that that it's you know yes performance is part of uh, you know search performance, but it's only a, I don't know what the actual percentage is, but it's only a small factor. There's a, there's like something like 500 factors that go into search rankings. So you know a lot of it has to do with your your actual content. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the structure of the page. Um, but there is definitely a performance thing, and that's what the the core web vitals are. And so Russ showed a, a really nice image of one of our sites that has that has no core web vital problems. Um, but if there are problems, like it, there is a noticeable dip in the overall sort of rankings for that site. So you know there is a correlation, but it's it's very hard to tell exactly what that correlation is. No, oh, I agree. I was just yeah. curious if if you were doing it. Yeah, we definitely are. We do our best. Yeah, you can use the Chrome uh, user experience um, uh, dashboards API to kind of get extra yeah. insight because that's where the information is coming from. Yep. Yeah. I guess I have a question still from the first um, first round. It's like a follow up. Um, so you mentioned the chasing waterfalls thing, which to me sounds like a almost like a production incident management rather than a prevention. Uh, so how much effort do you spend on like trying to, like you mentioned the LCP example, like when someone pushes a PR into production that causes the drop or the spike in the LCP and like how much effort you're actually putting into preventing these things? Like, are you tracking these things before they go into production? Like in your UAT environments, are you running these metrics before you push into production or are you just like trying to make sure that you're like, like, like almost like a smoke test of these things in production? Uh, yeah, so yeah, we have our DevOps pipeline, right? So what really, um, so yeah, during um, our, I mean, so right with the local development, developers should be doing that. But I mean, I think it's important to note that, I mean, these are always like shoulds. I mean, so, you know, I mean, sometimes people are in a hurry. I mean, and things have to get out. And sometimes, you know, it's great to always make sure they have great monitoring because sometimes if there's an urgent issue, if there's an outage, you know, maybe everyone isn't stopping to inspect that the waterfalls on every single 
device is is good, you know. So it's really so monitoring is extremely important and and to catch that. But but yeah, I mean it's really I mean we're looking at more ways to kind of build that into local development or so that more developers know about it. But yeah, definitely within our CI CD pipeline, um, if I mean if if there's a negative trend, then then yeah, then the work doesn't doesn't go out. Mm -hmm. Does that answer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about the role of CDN in your TTFBs. And secondly, if you could talk about ad load speed and how you think of that relative to the rest of the site performance. Oh, lovely. Okay. Uh, okay, so CDN first. Um, we, we actually resolve uh, requests back to the servers. That's how we do all that, that uh, server-side rendering, the bundling, uh, and and the the you know user agent based uh, device detection. So so we resolve back to the servers. The CDNs are are used a lot more for cached static resources, more so than like full document caching or or like you know web page caching. So it's more like the the front end resources that are at the CDN level. Um, and then uh, what was the other question? Uh, ads. Ads. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you already forgot. Yes, ads are fun. Um, we are actually in the midst of a big rollout of uh, ad performance metrics. Uh, and it is it is not my team. I don't know if you want to talk about it. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, no, he's right. So it, we, we actually just put out a, uh, a thing called Orion. Um, we realized that uh, all the... So okay, so, so there's not a whole lot of metrics on um, ads because we choose to sort of think of it as this horrible, evil black box, which it is many important ways, right? But therefore, <laughs> that we can't possibly inspect. We can't see what it does. And so we just, the goal has always been, you know, deflect it. Okay, let's try to make sure that we get the libraries in fast because we want to be able to execute. But then, you know, the actual ads themselves lazy load them or or push them off after the important bits or and both of which are valid strategies but it sort of abrogates the responsibility of finding out exactly how they're doing so yeah we just actually put out a thing that starting from you know zero point of 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 navigation uh load load end uh will measure the load times of all relevant ad libraries, including third parties and real-time bidders, measure the load times of each individual bid, uh, measure the load times of each individual slot and uh, and um, creative in that slot and pat at a sample rate, right? Because this would be like literally trillions of data points. So it does it at a fairly small sample rate, which is still billions of records um, and stores and passes that. And that's, but we're sort of in the in the middle part that we are is getting that into Looker so we can really cut that by like every single thing we do um, because it really helps make the case of like, huh, you know, brand X, your performance is dramatically worse than brand Y. And so 85% of your bid requests are missing the threshold that we set. And these guys are making... The eighty-five percent of theirs are making theirs. So, do you want to maybe do something about that? Which means that if they do, because we're America's largest digital print media thing, um, <laughs> then that helps make it better for everybody, right? Because now anybody else who's using bidding partner X has had their load times dropped from seven hundred fifty milliseconds per bid request to you know two hundred. So. Um, but again, and to Russ's point, like the important part is great. We're collecting these metrics now, make sure they're being circulated. But that said, our revenue groups are all very aware of like, oh, yes, faster ads equals people see them more. So duh, um, which is great. Um, but yes, so ads are tricky. And yes, you can delay them and you can sort of stuff them under the bed. But eventually you need to take hard looks at, well, why are they so slow and so bad? And yes, there's some irreducible problems also like, I can't fix the Google, you know, the, the GPT.js. Nobody here, maybe, I don't know if you can, please do. <laughs> I can't, they can't. Um, but at least we can know from then on, like where are our problem points and, and try to identify them. Can I just add something about the uh, CDN? So yeah, our CDN does um, 
you know, uh, add a lot um, of reduction to time to first bite as well, because um, we, uh, you know, terminate the TLS uh, closer to the um, closer to the client uh, at the edge. So that's a big reduction in uh, TTFB time. Also, we're active active with our um, origins. So we use a CDN to route the um, clients to the closest origin. So it's a big CDN takes a big uh, reduction to our time to first bite. Mm, thanks, Matt. Question or answer part. <laughs> Question. <laughs> um, if you were to be setting up monitoring for an embedded um, widget or a third party tool, what would you focus on? And uh, what concerns do you think would be different than just the, the core site itself? Yeah. Uh, wow. Um, I mean, I think it's it's probably more of the same thing, right? Because it's it's a it's in theory a web page within a web page. So how long that thing shows takes to show up? How long it's sort of like, you know, does it give you a, like a height parameter so it doesn't cause a massive shift on on the web page it's embedded on? Uh, you know, does does it reach interactivity quickly? So probably a, a lot of the same metrics. Um, also, just specifically within Catchpoint, you can use their insight indicators to kind of uh, trigger kind of certain monitoring of certain elements. And then also from the Lighthouse side, uh, you can use user flows, uh, which will be really important as interaction, bleh, interact, interaction to next paint. I got that. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, as that becomes live, uh, which um, when I spoke with Google uh, Chrome devs in January, they said, well, they'll obviously be talking about it in April, but they were like, it's coming, we'll be measuring everything, and we can't really tell you what we're gonna wait. So like heavily, and so that was scary. So obviously iframes <laughs> and ads are like big, big offenders. So kind of being able to, within maybe your Lighthouse user flow, create your selector and your action and make sure that, because Lighthouse doesn't read um, scroll either. So uh, making sure that you target those elements, I think would really help. I actually have a question uh, um, about the, measuring not the website but how does your business uh, actually improve performance like measuring the business impact uh, or not impact sorry the activity activity how do you know anyone reads those charts <laughs> it's a basic question <laughs> <laughs> how do i make sure uh, across the organization or yeah i mean it's important i mean the best thing to do is to make sure that everyone is that's why I like kind of was like made, you know, tried to act like you know curiosity was like a philosophy uh, because uh, I, I want to try to help everyone in the engineering organization have some enthusiasm and interest in it, um, and uh, and so that's that's like I think the best line of defense because they're the ones going off and having the meetings there. They're the ones who are, you know, so the brand manager, they're the ones on a call like with products saying we need this and, you know, they're, and like I can't be in all those places and I, you know, none, none of us can. So, you know, they're the ones who really get to do that. So, but yeah, I mean, and, um, and then trying to find ways that the, those aren't conflicting interests because uh, that happens a lot because people go in just assuming that they're not going to work together. Like they're like, well, my interest with performance or that techie stuff isn't going to, it's just not going to help me with the feature I want. So like, it's just trying to create a culture where that doesn't happen. I, you know, but you know, but that's uh, I don't know if you have one something you want to add to that. Well, I, I just think that Russ won't toot his own horn, but um, uh, the, the speed team actually does a lot of um, active remediation. So, so like they they aren't just sort of responding to issues and looking at like, whoa, what happened? It's it's a lot of uh, how can we make us even faster. Like, you know, what could we do to push the envelope even further? So it's, it's you know, the monitoring is, is sort of like, you know, embedded in our culture. And we, we you know, uh, we um, emphasize its importance across the org. Um, but, but also, you know, like Russ's team is, is actively looking like, what can we do to improve time to interactive? What can we do to, you know, uh, I don't know, get this new image format? Like, we, we're going to need to do this and this and this. So and come up with a plan on how to roll that out. So we're always pushing to continue to improve. Yeah. Last question. A real quick one about uh, back to the chasing the, well, 
waterfall was it? I'm wondering how do you integrate the rest of your engineering work into, let's say, these incidents? Because I'm assuming you, your backend setup is also quite complex and things can happen on various you know, layers on the backend, which you haven't really seen, but like, how do you, how do you catch the right people from be it you know, the Redis, Redis expert or whatever your you know, Java guys? Yeah, so we're looking, so right now, like we started definitely with front end, right? Like we're like, let's look at those core vitals. But yeah, there's like, even yesterday, I um, had a meeting with one of our uh, services directors to kind of think about, okay, how do we leverage Catchpoint to look further into the stack or into different services to kind of catch things happening? I mean, and certainly, um, I mean, um, Matt and uh, Jeremy will be able to speak in more detail about all the stuff they're kind of working on and road mapping there, but um yeah, so I, I think that's um, really cool. I think there's a lot of tools that create a more cohesive picture. Uh, so that way it's a little less like backend versus front end. But um, uh, yeah, and then i um, trying to see if I, was that answering your question? Just what is like how you integrate all the functions so that everybody's aligned and, you know, mm -hmm. working towards the same goal, basically, performance wise. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's like, it's definitely figuring that out, you know, to see. A cohesive picture because right we can keep adding tools and tools and processes and processes to be like well you know you should before you you know we'll have this commit hook that's going to run this locally right like once you start adding a ton and a ton and a ton it really you know can cause problems so yeah creating that cohesive picture is really important so yeah i yeah maybe uh the the one thing i do want to add is is that because performance is part of our culture everyone cares about it so like you know, a backend developer is going to care about the, you know, the response time of their code and, and how it executes and all of that. And if there is a an issue, uh, like we we find, a, you know, a problem with, with some metric on the front end uh, or just a, a problem with a site in general, you know, a bunch of different teams will actually send someone to respond and, and are excited and curious to, to help out and see if it's, you know, is it something that I can help with? Is it something that, that like, you know, is maybe on another area, but it's, it's really, really embedded in our culture. So I think a lot of people and a lot of teams hold themselves accountable. Yeah. They care a lot. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, with calls and stuff. I mean, it wasn't like I came in and like no one cared. Like they, I mean, they were, they all knew it better than I did, you know? So I like had to really scramble for a few months to make sure I had I think the most, like, uh, most telling thing is the CEO of our parent company, uh, IEC, um, talked about web speed in the shareholder letter. So that's nice. kind of the first thing. We all jealous. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right, thank, thank you very you. much.